Yes, all good people do go to heaven. Find out why next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. What does it take to get to heaven when you die? Who will be allowed inside the pearly gates? What will the Lord say to people on the great day of judgment? All of us who believe in heaven want to know the answers to those questions. In fact, people in nearly every culture on earth tend to believe in some type of afterlife or existence after death. Our desire to understand the meaning and purpose of life is simply not satisfied with the grave ends all philosophy. But what kind of existence will we have after death? Is heaven real? And is there really a hell? And if so, who is going there? Well, Matthew chapter 25, verses 33 and 34 say, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Some years ago, when several Pennsylvania miners were trapped underground awaiting rescue, a young miner awaiting rescue began to think that he might die. And he started talking to one of the others who was trapped about what would happen when he died. Later in an interview with Dateline NBC, he said he asked the older man, Will I go to heaven when I die? He went on to say that he had never been baptized and that he knew the Bible says one must be baptized in order to be forgiven of his sins. And he said the older man tried to comfort him by telling him, All good people go to heaven. And then he added, no matter what. Well, was he telling that man the truth? Do all good people go to heaven? We would like to think so. And actually, I do believe that all good people go to heaven. And I'll explain why in a moment. If you've ever visited an assembly of the Church of Christ, you've seen that it's different. No rock bands, no choirs and praise teams, no theatrical productions. That's because we believe worship is simple but profound and is according to what's revealed in God's Word. When you visit with the Church of Christ, you'll find that everybody simply sings the praise of the Lord together, congregationally. We meet around the Lord's table every Sunday to remember the body and blood of the Lord and His new covenant. We pray together, and none of that pop psychology, but sound teaching from the Word of God. Oh, and one more thing, we won't ask for your money. Members provide for the needs of the local church through a weekly collection. So forget all the hype. Come see the difference and be our honored guest today. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Dealing with the death of someone we love is always difficult, especially in view of the afterlife and the prospect of eternal reward or punishment. And we tend to comfort ourselves by thinking about the positive traits and virtues in that person's life. Uh, most of us, in fact, believe that it's important for a person to try to be a good person. And I suppose most would also say that there must or at least be some, or should be, at least should be some kind of justice. Uh, for those people, punishment for those people who do mean and wicked things to others. 
Well, if we believe there is a hell, we want to believe that it is reserved for the most heinous and mean and morally bankrupt people, villains and wicked men who abuse and mistreat others. A uh, hell is for people like Mao Zedong and uh, Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, now, perhaps Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. Perhaps we reserve a place in the flames for child molesters and murderers, uh, Satanists, and of course the devil himself. But really, that's about it. We can't conceive of our neighbor going to hell. Uh, we can't grasp the idea of a loved one spending eternity apart from God in hell. Uh, regardless of whether a person actually obeyed the gospel and followed Jesus, if the person was nice, had good intentions, was charitable, uh, lived a respectable life as we think of it, or did some virtuous thing in our eyes, then we tend to think, well, surely that person will go to heaven. Uh, after all, how could a loving God allow a good person to be punished forever in hell? Uh, so what if they didn't understand the Bible? Uh, so what if they really weren't a Christian as we define Christian? Uh, so what if they weren't a, a part of the church? I just have to believe that all good people go to heaven, and, you know, if God is love, it can't be any other way. Well, it may surprise you to hear a Christian preacher say, yes, it's true, all good people go to heaven. I really believe they do. In fact, the righteousness and justice of God demand that all people, good people, go to heaven. Did you ever think about the fact that God Himself wouldn't be good if good people did not go to heaven? The Apostle Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth Him and worketh righteousness is accepted with Him. Uh, Abraham asked God long ago to spare the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if righteous people could be found within them. And he reasoned with God like this in Genesis 18 and verse 25. Uh, he says, God, it would be far from your character and nature to slay the righteous with the wicked. And, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Then he says, shall not the judge of the earth do right? Well, we need to remember some things about God. Number one, don't forget God is the lawgiver. It's God who makes the rules. It's God who gave the law. It's God who uh, gives a standard of morality. He alone is the source of goodness and morality. He defines what is good and what is bad. Consequently, if there were no God, what possible basis for right and wrong would we have? It would all be subjective at best, and man could uh, decide that any kind of behavior, no matter how reprehensible you or I might think it is, a man could decide that that behavior is good, that it's acceptable. Uh, how do we define good versus evil if that does not come from outside of us? So truth is transcendent. God is the source of truth. He is the source of morality. He is the source of the definition of all virtue by essence of who He is and what He is. Number two, remember that God is perfect. God cannot sin. He cannot lie. He cannot go against His own word. He would not be God if He did. Number three, God is just. Don't forget that. God is just. And not only can God not refuse to punish sin and still be who He is, have you stopped to think about the fact that on the other hand, He cannot refuse one who has not sinned? Uh, he would not be just and fair and righteous if He punished someone who had done nothing wrong. So therefore, in keeping with the justice and the holiness and the righteousness of God, uh, I believe all good people go to heaven. The problem is, who's good? What does it mean to be good? Are you good? Am I good? Is my mother and father, are they good? What about my neighbor? Are they good? You know, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, a young man came running up to Jesus. And he asked him, he said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, we don't know a great deal about this man or who he was, and we can only really speculate as to his motive in asking Jesus this question. But it seems to me that he was honestly impressed with Jesus and was sincerely asking him 
about how to go to heaven. Now, I want you to notice that this young man used the word good like we often use the word good to refer to people. He calls Jesus good master. The word there for master means teacher. Well, what does he mean by it? A good teacher. Well, perhaps it was merely a way of showing his respect for Jesus. But I think he was most likely acknowledging the Lord's moral character. He was impressed with Jesus on some count. And not only does he call the Lord good, he then goes on to ask, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? I really believe this man thought Jesus was a good man like we think of goodness. Uh, like we look at some seemingly virtuous or impressive person and believing that Jesus understood the will of God, he wanted to know what good deed he could do that would make God accept him and allow him to go to heaven. I, I think this young man thought of much like multitudes of people around us think today. Uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus is good in the sense that he's morally superior um, he was a good man. He was a good teacher. And you know, if I just try to be good, then I'll get to go to heaven. Surely there's some good thing that I can, I can do, some good imp uh, quality that I can possess. If I just give enough to charity, if I'm just good and kind enough to people who are uh, less fortunate than I am, if I just go through life and try to be nice and, and uh, well-intentioned and so forth, and surely if I do some good thing, I can go to heaven. But how did Jesus answer him? In verse 17, Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? Why callest thou me good? Uh, Jesus says, There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. You see, Jesus wants this young man to understand the meaning of the word good. And he says, Only God is good. And he wants this young man to know that if he really means what he says, then he is acknowledging a great truth about Jesus Christ. And that is not that he is merely an impressive man, not that he has some uh, upright and commendable qualities, but he's saying that if you say that I am good, you're saying that I am God, because only God is good. He's telling this man that if Jesus is truly good, then he is deity, because God alone is is good. You see, we've given the word good a relative meaning. Uh, we say that a person, if he has some commendable moral quality, or if a person is kind and caring and giving, well, we say that that is a good person. Uh, after all, who would put Mother Teresa in the same category with Jezebel? Or, or who would put somebody who went about caring for the poor or the sick in the same category as Charles Manson? regardless of their religion or personal morality. Uh, we wouldn't equate such a person with uh, a wicked person like that. And so we begin to reason that since this person is better than this really wicked person over here, then how could that person possibly be lost? And that's how we come to reason that all good people, good people, are surely going to heaven. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to say that your neighbor who minds his own business and pays his taxes and gives to charity and doesn't harm anybody, I'm not saying he's the same as somebody like Charles Manson or Timothy McVeigh. But you see, that's merely how we define good. Jesus says good means something else. God looks at goodness in a totally different way. And as God defines good people, well, it's absolutely true that all good people go to heaven. The problem is, where do you find a good person? You see, there really is no such thing as a good person. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good, and sinneth not. You see, only God is good. And all of us have fallen very short of the mark when measured by God's goodness and God's holiness. I cringe to think that there are people, and there are people, who claim to believe in God, uh, who claim even to be Christians, who would dare say, well, I like God, I love God, but I don't need His forgiveness because I'm a good person. No, no one 
no matter how rich, powerful, successful, well-intentioned, benevolent, kind, caring, or honest, no one has lived up to the standard of God. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul painted a dark and ugly picture of the pagan Gentile world, and he showed that they were sinners separated from God. But now, lest the religious Jews st stuck out their chest, Paul shows that they were no better off in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, he draws a powerful and convicting conclusion when he says in verses 9 and 10 of God's own people by way of the flesh, he says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then in verse 23 he goes on to say, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person who is able to choose between right and wrong has made wrong choices in his or her life. Because the Bible says unequivocally, without question, that we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how respectable you think your life may be. It doesn't matter how much you give to charity. It doesn't matter how much you engage in religious activity, how honest you are. The Scripture says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10 reiterates, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yes, all good people go to heaven, but there is no such thing as a good person. So where does that leave us? I'll tell you where it leaves us. It leaves us in desperate need of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 says that our sins have separated us from God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us that our sins make us deserving of eternal death. <laughs> that means every single one of us deserves to be cast into hell because we have sinned against the Lord. Surely you won't say, I've never sinned. But maybe you say, well, my sins aren't that bad. Uh, my sins aren't so terrible compared to somebody else's sins. Well, are you sure about that? You say, well, I've never murdered anyone. But yet 1 John 3.15 says that if you've ever hated your brother, you're a murderer. You say, well, I don't cheat on my husband or my wife. Well, good for you. But Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 28 that if you ever look at another person with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. You say, well, I don't steal. But do you ever covet? Have you ever, ever told a lie? Have you ever misled or deceived someone? Have you ever been drunk? Have you ever attended a drinking party? Have you ever used God's name in vain or uttered a profanity? Have you always done right by others in every circumstance, every situation, every person you've met? Have you ever failed to do something the Bible says that we are to do? You see, those are all things clearly spelled out in God's Word as sins. Defined by God's Word as sin. And James said in James chapter 2 and verse 10 that if you keep the whole law but offend in only one point, you become guilty of all of it. Well, what are we to conclude from all of that? That we're all sinners. We've all been sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all in need of redemption. We're all in need of Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And listen, all of your good deeds don't change that. Your good intentions don't change that. There is only one way to be accepted by God, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us are defiled and stained by our sins on our own, but Jesus died on Calvary to atone for our sins. He shed His blood so that our sins could be forgiven, and we could be justified and washed white. And we can only be declared righteous in the eyes of God through the forgiveness of our sins obtained through obedient faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions to that. All good people go to heaven. But the only way God will ever look at me and declare me as good is through and by the redemption that is offered through Jesus Christ and what He did upon Calvary. Ananias told Saul in Acts 22 and verse 16, And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
Cornelius of Acts chapter 10 had to do just that. Just like Saul of Tarsus. Now, by the way, Saul of Tarsus was a religious man. Saul of Tarsus never violated his conscience, but he did some terrible things. And he was a sinner in the sight of God. Ananias told him he had to be baptized to wash away his sins, call on the name of the Lord in order to be saved. And then we come to the case of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, the very next chapter. He had to do the same thing. The Bible tells us in Acts 10 and verse 2 that Cornelius, though, was devout, that he feared God. Luke tells us that Cornelius gave alms. He gave to the poor and that he prayed always. Now, most people would call Cornelius a good man. They would say Cornelius is a good man. Who would say that a man who's devout? I mean, here, here's the kind of man that uh, you see who uh, he goes to worship regularly. Here's a man who digs deep in his pocket. He gives to the poor and the downtrodden. Uh, he lives a very humble life, fearing God and trying to obey the Lord. Here's a man who's always praying. Most would call him a good man. But what did God say about him? What does the Holy Spirit in His Word say about him? That Cornelius was lost because he was outside of Christ. He had to send for Peter to come and preach the gospel to him, to tell him about Jesus. And Peter finally said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? He had to believe and obey Christ in order to be saved. There was no exception to that, and there is no exception to that. Good people go to heaven, but you see, Cornelius, as good as we might like to think that he was, Cornelius in all actuality was not a good man because he was outside of Jesus. He was in his sins. Saul of Tarsus was not a good man because he was in his sins. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person apart from the Lord Jesus Christ because we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so I ask today, are you in Christ Jesus? Because only those who are in Christ are going to heaven. Now, I know that's awfully narrow. I know that excludes a lot of people who we think are good people. But Jesus said that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And you only get into Christ through the obedience of faith in the gospel. And very sadly, Paul declared that when Jesus returns, He will take vengeance on them who know not God and who obey not the gospel. He says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7-9. through 9. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying those who have never obeyed the gospel and thus remain in their sins, they're not fit for the presence of the Lord. They can't live for eternity in the presence of a holy and perfect and righteous and just God. And so he says in flaming fire, the Lord is going to come and destroy them. And he says they're going to be banished from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. One of the most difficult seeming dichotomies that we have to grapple with is that of the justice of God and the love of God, the holiness of God as opposed to the grace of God. And if we're not very careful as we look to the Scriptures for a picture of what God is like, then we will embrace some Scriptures and forget all about others, and we will come away with a distorted view of God. Is God love? Absolutely. Is God just? You'd better believe it. But you see, when we only take one attribute of God and we try to make that represent all of God, then what we do is we take half the truth and try to make it all of the truth and it becomes an untruth. The fact of the matter is God is love. He's love in that He wants the sinner to be saved. He's love in that He provided an atonement for our sins. He's love in that He sent Jesus in His grace and mercy to die upon the cross so that we could go free from sin. But He's just in the sense that sin will either be punished through the vicarious sacrifice of His Son Jesus or the sinner will pay for his own sin in death. And if we don't remember that, if we're not careful, we will allow our emotions and our human reasoning to create a God who doesn't exist. God is holy, God is righteous, and only those made fit for His association will be allowed into heaven, His perfect dwelling. Let me remind you of what Paul said in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 24. He said, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. 
If you've never been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we'd be so glad to help you do that today and begin serving the Lord and preparing to live eternally in the presence of a holy God. But you must have your sins washed away. You must be in Christ. You must be in His body. The Bible says that He is the Savior of the body. You must faithfully serve Him all of your life if you would ever expect to spend eternity with Him in the great by and by. All good people go to heaven, but every person is in need of Jesus in order to be good. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, Well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. If you would like a printed copy of our lesson today, All Good People Go to Heaven, we'll be happy to send it to you free of cost. Simply ask for the lesson by that title when you write or email us this week, and we'll give you our contact information in just a moment. Thanks for joining us today on Let the Bible Speak. We hope you'll make your plans to be right back here next time, the Lord willing, for another study from God's Word. In the meantime, check out our website, letthebiblespeak.tv, and also go to our social media sites, Facebook and Twitter. And we do hope you'll tell someone else about Let the Bible Speak. And We'll see you back here, Lord willing, next time for another study. Until then, may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.